Okay, so uh, my name is Chris Jarvis. Um, I'm going to be recording the life story of Alan Gilmore and Manuel Carello. This uh, recording is happening on August 18th, uh, 2019 at 8454 North 3rd Street in Fresno, their home. So as we begin, can I have you state your name uh, along with your age and your preferred pronouns? <laughs> Alan Gilmore, 62, uh, he, him, he and him. Okay. Mm -hmm. Never did uh, right. Manuel Carollo, uh, 70, uh, he, him, that's fine. Okay. So um, just some general questions to start, Alan. Why don't we start with you? Mm -hmm. um, let's, can you talk about when and where you were born? I was born in a little town over on the west side of the valley called Avenel. Um, uh, so it's in Kings County. Um, born and raised in two years of junior college at West Hills Community College um, over there. Um, uh, like family structure kind of stuff too? Sure. Okay. So, um, so I was actually an oops baby as far as I'm led to understand. I don't think my family thought that they were going to... My mom was 38 when she got pregnant with me. And so I was kind of a bit of a surprise. Um, so at the time that I was born, I had a 16 year old sister and my mom and my dad, that, that was our family. And at the age of five, my dad had a heart attack and passed away at the time that I was five. And then when I was nine, my sister, after having gone through several years of um, experiencing Hodgkin's disease, she passed away at the age of 24. And so my mom was left with me. And at that time, um, my sister had been married and had a child. And so her grandchild was also a part of our family. And um, so it was kind of a weird situation only because there was a 16 year difference between my sister and I, but there was a four year difference between my nephew and I. So my nephew and I were were really kind of raised like brothers. Um, and so, um, like I said, um, elementary school, high school, and then went over to, and then commuted um, to Kalinga every day. Scoot! Um, for um, two years of junior college. Then moved to Fresno to go to Fresno State. What year was that? 1977. Okay. Um, so, um, moved to Fresno to go to Fresno State, um, and didn't... did you move, uh, by yourself? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I had, um, an apartment across from the college, um, and started going to school, um, got some job. I was working all through school. My dad's social security, we, it kept coming because I stayed in school. So that was really the way that we financed my college education was between me working and um, the social security that my mom had been getting since I was a since I was five because of my dad passing away. So anyway, um, and Fresno State was a was I don't I don't know if to go into this, but Fresno State was critical because they had something called Gay Awareness Days. Um, so I have to think it must have been in seventy. Eight, seventy-eight, maybe. Um, I had heard, I'd seen the posters, I'd heard about it, um, mm -hmm. and I decided on the night that they were having their big event. Well, maybe I just need to go to the library and study tonight and stuff, so <laughs> I could be on campus. So, and I finally made my way over to the student union, which is where they were having the event, and I just kind of peeked in. And I actually saw a girl uh, that was participating that was um, had been in one of my classes. And so um, I just went up and started talking to her. And I said, I said, this is all for gay people, right? And she goes, yeah. And I said, are you gay? And she said, yeah. And I said, well, I think I might be too. And that night I ended up in a gay bar. <laughs> okay. So, so prior to this, what were your thoughts about being gay? Did you have thoughts about Oh, God, being I knew gay? I was gay like from five or six or something like that. But... Um, it just, and I was the strange kid at school. I was the odd kid. I got picked on a lot. I, I was both kind of little, littler than a, physically smaller. I wasn't very adept at sports and I obviously was a little bit different. 
So I experienced a lot of um, bullying and um, and stuff. I had a small clique of friends um, that were really supportive, and that was great. But um, um, was the was bullying due to you think them the perception that, that the I was gay. That you were gay? Yeah. Right. Oh yeah, absolutely. So um, so, but um, you know, so I was I was kind of happy and excited to get get out of there. Um, but I literally walked into the circle the very first time and there were like seven people in it. It was like a Wednesday night or something like that. And I thought, oh, here are these seven other people who were gay <laughs> in Fresno. So so it was kind of, it was a little bit disappointing because it was like, I looked around and it was like, ah, this is everybody. I'm not quite sure I'm going <laughs> to meet anybody or whatever. So I think I went in, we had one drink and then I went out and, um, and then it was months later before I went back and stuff. And uh, so the Gay Awareness Days, what exactly was it? Was this tabling? Was it? Yeah, I think it was tabling. I, I remember the night I went that they, I think they were having a guest speaker. I want to say it was like somebody who had made a film or something like that that was there. And they were either showing the film and then had the person speaking or something like that. But I do remember it was in the Satellite Student Union. Um, and, um, and that experience of just seeing somebody that I knew that was sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, this is somebody I know, so maybe this would be a safe place to have that conversation. So. And did this lead to you coming out? Yeah, pretty okay. much. Pretty and what was that experience for you? Um, How did it happen? The uh, steps involved? And... It's crazy. I, had to, I, I um, had to share with my class. I, my class I started teaching on Tuesday nights. And I asked them to all stand up and introduce themselves and talk about their lives a little bit. And so I think it's only fair that I also have to talk about my life. And so it, it always, it's always like a deep breath when I say, and my husband and I, look, da, 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 da. so I think the coming out process is it never gets, but it gets easier, but it's always hard. And um, it was really, really hard. There would be, that, that was the time when you would see people out at the bar on Friday or Saturday night, but if you crossed them on the campus at Fresno State, they would look the other way and pretend they didn't know you and, um, and those kinds of things. So, um, but I do recall that I did get involved with something that they called Gay People's Union, which was a group on campus at Fresno State that interestingly enough was primarily composed of people who were not students at Fresno State. Cindy Williams was super involved <laughs> for a while. Um, and I think it was just that there were community members that wanted to have the capacity for something to be established at Fresno State, but it was so hard to get a gay identified student to actually step forward. And so I started going to those meetings and I think just because I was a student and I was attending the meetings, I got elected president for a year because, because they really needed somebody who was a student to be in that, because it, it was a student club. So, but it was funny because most of the people who attended the meetings and participated were not, were not students. But I remember that was, you know, some of the first time I met some other folks and stuff and like that. that was around 78. Around 78, yeah. Um, 78, yeah, because 79 is when we, okay. So, so 78, 70, I, maybe it was more like 79, to be honest with you. Because now that I'm thinking about it, it, it all happened really, really fast. Because Manny and I met in June, and I have to believe that, I think the whole um, Gay Awareness Days may have been like in the winter of 79. Because in six months, my whole life just changed. So from like January to June, it just went. So it happened really fast. Yeah, really fast. And were you living on campus? No. So were you living somewhere else with a roommate? Did you have a roommate? Or I had, the f at that point in time, I had two roommates. We were living at an apartment out in Clovis. And um, they were both straight. And, um, and I don't know. I mean, we were friends. One was a guy that I had gone to high school with. So he was from Avenel. So we'd known each other for a long, long time. But um, I don't know. I kind of kept a real separate life. Um, and you know, so I, if I went out on Saturday night, I didn't necessarily tell them where I was going and I didn't bring people home or anything like that. So, so, um, you didn't tell them you, you didn't come out to them. Oh God, no. Home, huh? Ever? No. Okay. What about your family? Yeah, I did that at, 
Easter, Ooh. I think. It was some big... No, that wasn't Easter. It must have been... You know what it was? It was either Thanksgiving or Christmas of 1979 because the reason that I wanted to talk to them was because I'd met Manny. Okay. And it was like, I'm in love and I want to tell you and all this kind of stuff. And so, um, so literally, I think it was like right after dinner, I said, well, by the way, I have something to share with you and all that kind of stuff. But you have to clarify, it was just her mother. Yeah, because it was just my... there is no other living relative. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah, because yeah. your father died when you yeah. were five. And yeah. So you just had your mom. But no aunts, uncles? No. No. Okay. And my nephew, um, David, who then six or seven later years later came out as gay himself. Oh, really? So, yeah. So, um, so anyway. Six or seven years after you came out. Yeah. Because when I told him, he must have been... He must have been like 14 or something like that. And he was... There's a whole lot, there's a whole other story about that where his father hadn't been in the picture and then all of a sudden his father stepped forward and sued for custody and got custody of him and it was another heartbreak for my mom and all that kind of stuff. But um, so for a lot of so from he was with my mom and me for a lot of years, but then there was a point where he was living in Taft with his dad. But every other weekend he was traveling back to Avenel to spend time with us, and so we must have. It must have been Thanksgiving or Christmas of 79 because we were all together at the house and I told him. So, so um, did you, when your nephew came out, did he come to you? And Yeah, he was living with Manny and I. Oh, okay. Yeah. But he did tell me that I was the last person he told because he was most afraid to tell me. Really? Yeah. And why was that? I don't know. Huh. I don't know. So, so um, he, he, he had gotten to know a lot of our friends and in fact, he and George were kind of hanging out, and that they they eventually became a couple. George was in flag core with me, so George was a good friend. But um, so he had told several people that were sort of in our sphere, um, but he hadn't told me. And we just went for a walk one afternoon. And so, what about um, early life? Um, Avenel and Taft, obviously, even more conservative than Fresno. Mm -hmm. um, what about any? gay influences or television or anything that you saw that you can remember touched you or there was a movie called An Early Frost mm -hmm. um, that I remember which was like the very first AIDS movie I think or Aiden something Quinn? Yeah, yeah Martin Sheen I think oh and there was the movie with Kate Jackson and the guy who used to be on the rookies oh Making Love yeah Making Love I remember that one um, and somehow, I, I think I got a hold of an Andy Warhol interview magazine, and somewhere in there, there was a magazine that they advertised that you could subscribe to that was called After Dark, which, quote, which tried to present itself as a theater magazine, but it was totally geared towards gay people and had a lot of semi-nude pictures in it and stuff like that and um and you with, got that in avenue yeah well it came like in a manila envelope so oh. nobody could see what was in it oh so you made and they mailed it to you yeah I, oh, because I, you did interview I, subscri I subscribed, subscribed to, to it i subscribed okay. well no i subscribed to after dark i don't oh, i think okay. i just picked up one interview magazine oh and, i see okay. but i saw the ad for this other magazine and i have to tell you that was my lifeline to what the gay what gay society was about because it was talking about theater and fashion and you know all these different kinds of things very it was like it was the first time i ever got to the place where i've got to go to new york i want to go to new york and all this kind of stuff because it was very new york specific and all that kind of stuff so and i know that you're into musical theater now yeah. so you were then as well yeah you know. yeah so that was one of your touchstones to the, to the gay community what did you feel and i'll share with you the very i went to there was a Store. There was a magazine and newspaper store and cigarette store and tobacco store in Hanford. And Hanford was kind of the big city for us to be able to go and stuff like that. And I remember going in and seeing my very first Playgirl. And every time we went to Hanford, it was like, I want to go to that. I, I need to go get a Sports Illustrated or something like that and all this kind of stuff. And I literally went in and bought because the other thing I did a lot of was read the LA Times and San Francisco Chronicle 
Um, but I went in and bought the San Francisco, the Sunday San Francisco Chronicle, and I actually stole a Playgirl by <laughs> sliding it into the newspaper and walked out the door with it. And that Playgirl took care of me for a long, 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 long time. <laughs> I remember going in, in, there was a store on um, Clovis Avenue called Price Right that isn't there oh, anymore, yeah. but mm -hmm. I went in, I lived right across the way there, and they had Playgirls, and I would go in, and I actually would, they were behind the counter, so I mm -hmm. couldn't steal it, or I probably would have to. Yeah. But I bought it along with something mm -hmm. else and just said right out loud, this is my, for my sister. Yeah. I got away with that a couple yeah. of times. Yeah. So um, you, what about uh, mm -hmm. since your father died when you were very young, five, what kind of influence did that have on you not having a dad around? Did your mom remarry? Did, no. were, there, were there other men around? No. 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 Uh -uh. So I'm sure, I'm sure it had an influence. I, it had more of an influence because... Um, as a family, we were just a little odd because we weren't husband and there wasn't a husband and wife. And um, my mom had not worked, and all of a sudden had to go to work. <coughs> and what did she do? She worked at the Montgomery Ward's catalog store. <laughs> oh, that was in cool. Col in those in days. Kalinga, that was her first job and then my dad had been a bookkeeper and accountant and his final job was that he was the administrator for the hospital in Avenel. so um, I think she had picked up some accounting stuff from him so um, then she got a job as a bookkeeper for like a car dealer and then she got a job as a bookkeeper for um, an auto parts store and I think she was with it was called Pippins I think they she was there for about 20 years um, but amazing woman because we never would have known that we were struggling at all based on there was always food in the refrigerator and she did income tax so our life was a little bit like um she had an she didn't really have a bedroom she had an office so she'd come home from work at 5 30 we would have cooked dinner we would eat dinner and she would have her first client at six during income tax season and she would see two or three people a night mm. um and so we always had to make sure the house looked good and that we took care of our own dinners and stuff like that. So it was it was just a non traditional childhood because because of just those circumstances. And then and then everything with my sister was there was a point in time where we my sister was in a hospital bed in our living room for months and months and months and that was interesting and weird. So um, but I mean she did she did a great job given all the circumstances that she found herself in. And what was her reaction when you came out? I think she was very reserved. I I think I don't think her first concern was what's going to happen to you because you're gay or I'm offended because you're gay. Her first reaction may have been, "Well, who's this guy and what how is what's he are you not are you doing things sexually? I don't know. That may have been the case or something like that. But I don't think she'd ever seen me where I'd been like this before. And I don't know. She may have been concerned about is is he going to make you move someplace or is he going to take there all any your money? Involved in any? No. 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 Uh -huh. no. And this was pre AIDS, so yeah. that wasn't really. To be yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's a that's a guess on my part. Um, but I mean, we got to the point where I mean, Manny would go over so she knew Manny and I mean he I think maybe we even went over a couple of holidays we used to do something where I think we do like Christmas Eve at Manny's mom's house but then Christmas Day at our house because all of it required travel a little bit so um, so I mean Manny would have to say whether he ever felt any like that was a never felt uncomfortable never felt uncomfortable so um and I think it got to the point maybe where eventually it was sort of like, well, okay, I understand you're gay, but it, you're with somebody who I think is going to take good care of you and be nice to you and that kind of stuff. And so I don't really care whether it's a guy or a girl. It's just as long as somebody's taking care of you. And that was all within that first night of you telling her? Oh, God, no, no. That was over the years. Okay. Uh, but that first night was... It was real... Um, it was basically 10 years from the time you met to the time she passed. It was 10 years that we were yeah. together. Yeah. And she participated in our life there was more of a reaction from my nephew which was interesting like nephew how, turned out to be good yeah like how could you do this to mom and 
um, you know, and all this kind of stuff. I think it, there may have been, that this is me totally speculating, I, I just don't think she had a point of reference. Mm. Like, okay, you're gay, I'm not quite sure what exactly that means. I mean, I know what it means, but I don't know what it means in terms of your life and your day-to-day -day life and what it means in terms of our relationship and stuff like that. And really nothing changed. I think it got better because the whole reason I kind of shared this with her was because our Sunday afternoon phone calls had gone from like 30 minute phone calls to like four minute phone calls because there were so many things I was doing that I couldn't tell her about. Mm. Like I went out last night and we danced all night or um, I went with Manny to this or uh, oh I went to this court function or all this kind of stuff and I, until I told her I couldn't share that stuff with her. And I do remember that we used to talk about court stuff and she thought it was kind of fun and funny and hmm. stuff like that. How about in school? Did you know of any other kids that you thought might be gay? Oh, I've since learned. It's so funny. Paul, who's in my, between my junior and senior year, this friend of mine, Paul, I can't remember his last name anymore, um, our parents gave us permission to move to San Luis Obispo for the summer. I don't know what they were thinking. Um, so we moved over, we found an apartment, we got jobs, um, and like three years later I found out that Paul was screwing around with the other bus boy <laughs> at whatever the place where he got the job at and um, that he, you know, was, he was down in Los Angeles, I think trying to be an actor and all these different kinds of things. So it was, um, it was, it was interesting in that regard. So I'm trying to remember, I can't. I can't think of, I mean, since people, it's funny because the place where I have a lot of connections sometimes with people still in high school is like on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And so now when it gets to the point where I say, my husband and I just celebrated our anniversary, it's interesting the people that write back and say, hey, congratulations, that's so great. And it's like, oh my God, you were, last time, I haven't seen you in 40 years or whatever, right. but you know, you went to high school with me. I wish I would have known that you would have been <clears throat> open to this then. And so, who knows if they would have. Yeah, they may not have been, but it's nice to know that every we all, that all can grow and mature. Yeah. yeah. And uh, was Manny your first serious relationship? Oh, God, yeah. No. Did you date before that, or? Mm, no. Well, there was this, there was one guy, I wasn't interested in him, but he was very interested in me, and um, we went out a few a few times, but nothing Nothing ever happened. So. so when you go to the bar to circle or whatever, you just go by yourself and... No, I went with all these friends from Fresno State. Oh, okay. Yeah. The ones that you met through the, the gay awareness? Right. Gay... Okay. And they were the ones that were on the bus ride to San Francisco to go to Pride the night I... The, the weekend I met Manny. Okay. All right. Let's so. talk about that. Let's go, let's go over to you, Manny, now and mm -hmm. then talk about your childhood and stuff. Ooh. And then we'll come back and talk about uh, the two of you together. So, yeah, that was... Uh... So Seb being, we have an eight year age difference, so I'm 70, so when I met him I was almost 30, so I was born in 1948. When and my mom had married, because um, my mother was Swiss Italian, she got pregnant with a uh, Hispanic, so that was a taboo in those days. And all where the, were you born? In Fresno. So in I've Fresno. been in Fresno all my life, okay. except for the years that I was away in the seminary and the service and I'll touch on later. But so one of the things early on was sort of that stigma of being sort of wanted, but sort of not wanted in the family. So I'm sorry, say that again. Your mom was Swiss? Swiss, so considered white or Swiss right. Italian. Okay, and your father? And was Hispanic. Hispanic, okay. So on the Hispanic side, very many, a lot of brothers and sisters. But what happened is I was born in 48. My brother was born two years later. So there were two of us. But it was not well received on the my mother's side of the family. So uh, by the end of three years, they got a divorce. So that was all separated. But so that Hispanic side of my per person is, I did not know anything about until when I, in my teens is when I try to reconnect with my Hispanic side through my aunts. So, um, so when they divorced, you lost contact with your father, it. everything. No. Yeah, I never knew. I saw my father once in my teens, and I, I think I accidentally saw him at the VA hospital a few years back because I think I knew what he looked like because there were pictures that his second wife had posted 
in his military. He was a veteran. Okay. And I, and I, but I remember seeing his name on the, the the. There's a thing on the board in the VA that your prescription is ready. Right. But they right. put your name. Right. And I saw the name up there. I'm going, well, there's only one. And and then I said I looked around. I said he's in this room, along with another a lot of other. Short Hispanic, Hispanic men, <laughs> men and I don't know which one is which. So I just sort of like, okay. So that was, there, was, there was never a connection. So as I grew up, but the thing that happened um, when I was six, not quite seven and 56 or whatever, she contracted polio and that changed everything. Her second husband left her because of the polio. This is so what year, Manny? Probably 1956, so I would have been okay. seven. And so, unfortunately, during that whole time, she was in an iron lung for a year, completely paralyzed. And when the hospital basically said, okay, you're fine, you can breathe now on your own, you can go, she had to come back to my grandparents, who had a farm. My grandfather had a farm up by Kearney Park. So, he was a rancher and dairy man, basically did a lot of stuff himself. So, here's my mother coming home, and, you know, nothing was handicap accessible in those days. So basically, as for a the result next, of the polio change. yeah. So she had a problem, but through her, her but genetic makeup yeah. and her survivor skills, she basically walked again. The only thing oh, that was left was she had a uh, paralysis of her right arm. She could use it, but she could not use her hand to function. She could move, but she she was left-handed. And but she could walk. She was not in a wheelchair. She, she's not. She walked. She went on. And she lived another 64 years until she passed at almost 89, wow. a year or two back. Resilient, difficult woman. Talk uh, about the difficult woman. Well, yeah, well, she, well, well, what happened is you have to talk about, and, and personalities, and I think it changed. She was very, um, an individual girl when she was growing up. She was obstinate, she was tomboyish, she was, you know, um, but, uh, she respected my parents and my grandparents and they sort of had a love-hate relationship with her father my grandfather but uh, she survived on her own um, but she I think her personality changed a little bit during that episode she with the polio she, with the polio she just was a survivor she just would not put up with anything from anybody and if it displeased someone else and a lot of people in the family because they basically consider her the black sheep of the family. And my family extends through my aunt and my uncles with many cousins, which is just the opposite of Allen's. There's a lot of people out there, a lot of very conservative people out there, West Side ranchers, even to this day. To this day, my mother's sister, my aunt, is the only one remaining of the two sisters and brother, and cousins and second cousins and all that. But during that time in the 50s, I lived with my grandparents because she was incapable of taking care of it. So it was my grandfather's influence. This did not bode well for my brother, who had um, uh, issues at that, formative issues, because then he finally just kind of rebelled, went into foster care by the time he was 11 or 12, and was very difficult. And his whole life after that was just sort of a mess because of just those imprinting, formative, stressful years that he was experiencing. I sort of survived it um, by probably my own free will. And so during that time, between the time that she was, she was, she would find jobs and stuff, be supported by my grandfather in many ways. Sometimes I go live with my grandfather. Sometimes I'd stay with my aunt because I had four cousins that I was close to. But by the time, really by the time I was a sophomore in high school at, Wa at Washington Union, which I had no issues in school. Um, I was never bullied. I was never, I was a charmer. I got along with the girls. That was the best gay boy friend. They didn't know it in those days because this was in the 60s. But I went to all the dances, elected, you know, treasurer, Mount Washington Union. So I was personable. And for me, that was a survivor skill. Nothing was ever talked about at home. I knew that I was gay when I was 10 years old. I mean, I knew that, but I also knew that, you know, and had a few, and a couple experiences when I was in grammar school. Um, but uh, then, experiences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
um, no, nothing elaborate, but that sort of experimentation kind of thing. But by the time I was 13, going into 14, um, whether it was real, I think it was real. I got the the um, the desire to join the priesthood. So by the time I was finishing, finishing off my sophomore Washington Union out in Easton, I'd already made arrangements to go to in the seminary. And when I found the order that was stationed in Santa Cruz, they had the church to the to this day. They still have a church um, in Madera, St. Joachim's, and so when I finished my sophomore year of I still know I was gay but that time you suppress it because now you're going to a quote a religious kind of right. environment cool. um, and not that I outwardly acted out on any of that when I was you know, from 10 to 13 or 14 so then I went into the seminary my junior year in Santa Cruz so I stayed there my junior and senior year in the meantime, my mom was still on her own, doing her own thing, and um, um, my aunt, because it was a tuition to go, my aunt took care of that, so um, they were paying for that, that tuition that was needed. So when I left in 64, from 64 to 74 is when I left home. For 10 years, I was away from home. Letters. So 64, you were 17? 64, I was 14. 14? Because I graduated in 66 okay. from high school. So my junior, sophomore year, I was in Santa Cruz, going through the studies, thinking living that that there. was living there. Yeah. And then coming home during the summer of after 66 of um, June, and having basically my last vacation for a while with them, because I joined the novitiate, the order, the next September. So from 66 to 70, I was in a religious order, and I decided to stay and take vows the year after I went through my postulancy period, which is, and then your novitiate formative time where they kind of assess to see if this is what you really want. And then I took my vows um, in 67. So I had the habit to call her the whole bit. I was... But this was a very, in the Catholic Church at that time, was very disruptive. The Second Vatican Council had happened. I was going to Sierra Junior College, and I was exposed to a lot of men in gym class and this and that. You know, and I'm coming, I'm seeing all this, still knowing that I'm gay, not now knowing what it's all about. And then coming back to the, <laughs> you know, changing out of my civilian clothes, going back to the novitiate house in Sacramento and then putting on my habit and my collar and going to say my rosary. And I'm going, you know, this is not, this is not working. It's working in the sense that this is what I really wanted to do, but I knew that the orientation part was not compatible. Or I, I look back now, or I look at it now, and I would have, I would have been a statistic along with all the statistics, because you're going to act out eventually. So I decided to leave right before I was taking, not your final vows, but your final vows that's really going to commit you to this order. And my order was a very conservative Italian order. So they were very conservative in every aspect of Catholic, Catholic uh, doctrine, abortion, marriage, communion, the whole bit. So I left in 69. So I left in 69. It was heart-wrenching because I lost uh, I left something that I really enjoy to this day I still miss it even 50 plus years later because I actually left what is what is month is this August August I left in March of 69 so 50 years ago I left and what I don't know if I missed it but what mm -hmm. drove you into this arena in the first place I just you know I was going to I went through my Grandparents were sort of religious. My aunt was. So we were going to church, and I thought, well, maybe this is... Now, I don't know whether it could have been... And I said this day, it could have been just an out. Like, I needed an escape from... Because there was a lot of times when it was tumultuous at home. Mm -hmm. I found respite and refuge and at my grandparents. Whenever it was my mom, it was just like real, you know. And your mom, you said you lived with your grandparents. Where was your mom? She would find a home or an apartment somewhere. Oh. Multiple boyfriends multiple husbands she was so you said she was in an iron lung no 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 she was only during her year of uh oh, okay. okay by 50 
uh, seven. by 57, she was walking and, oh, I and doing stuff and going on with her life. But she was not... Um, I mean, she went through eight husbands. Wow. Uh, <laughs> so there was always... She was a needy person. Mm. And... And she, you know, she she had her own issues, so maybe that was, you know, a release or whatever. But it, it, I found it a wonderful experience, except for the gay part. It just wasn't going to work. So I think it was all about stability and consistency. Yeah, and and, and because my <clears throat> life is order, it was perfect. You get at a certain time, you do a certain. There's regimen. So when I, so when I got out of the, uh, I left the order. Came home in '69, so I left. In March, by March, April, May, by the first part, if not four to six weeks later, I was in the Navy. Because when I came home, after having my family put money into my education and all this uh, and stuff of being, become, you know, my is going to be a priest, you come home and all of a sudden that their dream is shattered. And it was not a welcoming experience when I came home. Mm. So, like I said, uh, and in those days, it was either you're going to get drafted because it was Vietnam year, or you join something. So I joined the Navy. In... Was the Navy one of your options before you got involved at the church? Was no, it... no, never. Because you said you were looking for an out, and I was thinking what the other obvious one well, was. Well, it was, it was, it was, it, I joined the, the Navy because I knew I was going to get drafted in the Army, and I did not want to go to Vietnam. Everybody did in those days, they didn't want to go. Right. But I didn't have any reference because I was in a religious environment, shut off from everybody for six years almost. So you get back in, into the real world and you say, oh, there's a war going on in this. And you're only 19 so or 20. They want you. So I went down to the recruiter's office down on Fulton <coughs> Street and joined and uh, got accepted. So... Um, God, I went to the Navy recruiter, that's right. So then that whole thing, you're going to go to the Navy, you go to San Diego, and that was in 69, probably April or May. Because from that time on, I went through boot camp. And in boot camp, there's, there's a questionnaire they give you. And what you fill out probably is destiny for you for your four years. And somewhere in there, I made a reference to a hospital. And I did. I worked... In the seminary, we did a lot of volunteer work, so we worked at the state hospitals when they were still open and, um, and helped out. So I saw, I think they saw that, so I got assigned as a hospital corpsman. Mm. Um, so I said, oh, what is those? Okay. So what happened is then I go to core school during the summer in San Diego, and then you will get an affiliation or a designation to be a regular corpsman or you'll be a corpsman attached to the Marines as a field medical technician. And that's what I got. So that meant that I, after I finished my time in San Diego, then I went to Camp Pendleton and I went through my Marine training, which was just awesome. <laughs> because awesome. As, because, because as, a, awesome. as a gay man, I'm, you know, I'm living in a community of men in a religious environment that are the same age. And they're, it's happening right now everywhere. I don't care where it is, whether it's the Vatican or your local parish. If you got a, well, we've seen older priests with young guys out and about. That's an issue that I. Do have. you think that there are a, a large amount of gay priests? Oh yes, yeah, yes. It's not so. It's yes. not just because no. the argument is they just they just don't have sex. Because I hear no. it all the time. We'll let them get married and they'll be fine. I don't no, think no, that's no, really no, it. No, that's. Why do you think gay men are attracted to the priesthood? There's a religious part of it, but I don't think, because you are around other men. Anytime, and especially an environment where women are excluded, there's, there's no co-eds, right, right. this is a purely man thing. Service was the same way, it was a man thing. And whether I was in boot camp, at uh, the very first, I can't remember how many weeks it was, to my core school, because that's when we finally, then I finally realized, there's other gay people here. We don't know what to call each other. This is 1969. Uh, but I remember being in Vietnam in 1970. I'll get to that. And one of the movies they showed was Boys in the Band. No, you're kidding. And I'm going, really? Really? Seriously? <laughs> in, in 1969 and 1970, you're showing this movie? 
in Vietnam yeah. with a bunch of drunken other you know, enlisted men wow. on movie night. And I'm going, none of this, so everybody's odd. just walking. And we had, and everybody, my years in the Navy were the best. But, so I joined, uh, went, got my designation, went to um, a year in Charleston, South Carolina as a corpsman in an intensive care unit, getting all that training. Then we got orders. There was a group of us from our hospital got orders to Vietnam. That was 1970. So at the end of 1970, we went to Vietnam. And I was, you know, whether it was my grandfather's influence or whatever, you just do what you do. I wasn't going to be a draft dodger or, you know, you. that was my um, whatever. It, it's just what you have to do. But... There was six of us, and we got into Da Nang, and then we didn't get orders. We didn't know where we were going. We had to wait there. And I can't remember how many days. It was several days until we finally got orders. And then I got myself and three other people got orders to go to Da Nang. We were in Da Nang to the Fuel Medical Hospital, First Marine Division Hospital, which would be comparable to your mass, mass, uh, mass, mass. unit. Yeah. Okay. The injured come in, triage, surgery to me. So I was there for six months, and some of my other friends went into to the field, to the bush, as they would say. And then the group of us went there, and I stayed there six months, and I got orders to go to the field. But they were, they were rescinded by my company commander, who did not want to send, because we learned a very technical job, uh, and no one could really do it. So I never went. So I was never proven, or I proved myself, so to speak. So you went to Vietnam. even even to this day, <laughs> anyone who does not go to the field, if they're back, always has that thing in the back of mind. Could I have done the job, or did I? What I, you know, it, still that year in intensive security was ugly. What do you mean you weren't proven? Explain well, that you, to me. you you prove yourself as a man. Okay, I can go out there in the field and take care of my Marines. You know, and I'm not going to be a coward. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm going to go out there and do it. So you're not tested. Um, I think I would have done it because that was just what a, a, mm-hmm. a job that I would have done. And you really uh, form this bond in the service. My, I always tell everybody that the best, to my, in my 70 years, the best year of my life was that year. Mm-hmm. As ugly and dirty and bloody as it was and the shit that I saw, it was still the best because of the camaraderie that you have with your fellow Marines, Navy men, whether more men than women, but we work more with men. There is just that thing that you develop, that bond. And I see it when I go to VA hospitals, I see it, you know, the service guy. Now some people take to a, a, a degree that I don't go. I never, when I left the service, I left the service. And for almost 50 years, 40 plus years, I never had any reason to deal with the VA until my life changed later on when I got older, um, where I went to the VA. Um, that's down the line. But the thing is, though, it was the best year. So when uh, that's interesting, I've never heard anyone say something like it that. Was. that the, the, the time in the war zone was the best year because my brothers were in. And one of my brothers. Was in Some Vietnam. will look at it. At, it, it is in its semantics. Cool. Um, um, Do you think you're looking at it that way now I'm because look- you're so far removed from it, or? Did you feel that same way? No, I felt like that even years after. There are, there are memories, there are moments that are still there, still like it happened just a minute ago. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was, and found love in Vietnam. I mean, the last thing, I, you know, the, one of the, there's a lot of moments. Um, well, and, tell me about that one. I want to hear Yeah, yeah, yeah. That. that was, you know, you always fall in love with somebody. I mean, that's just because we're in our teens and we're just, you know, whatever. And... Well, there was not so much boot camp, uh, more Charleston, South Carolina was just flings. You know, you meet up somebody and you kind of make that three second eye contact, forgive them. The, the difference between a gay person and a straight person is three beers, you know, that kind of stuff. So I would always find somebody, but it was always hidden. You never told it because it was very taboo. Very dangerous at that and time. And you could get kicked out with a dishonorable discharge. Right. So <coughs> how did you balance that? How did you... You were just cautious, somewhat, because just being, you know, in your late teens, you're just stupid. Mm-hmm. And, and you just have to be careful. Uh, but 
you know, it's going to the movies with somebody that you just met. Mostly it's the people you meet on the ward because you're being assigned and new people come in, people leave. And, um, you know, you go to a movie and all of a sudden your hand goes over and your hands are touching in the movie theater and then, you know, two days later you're in, you're in your room uh, having a tryst <laughs> and telling them to be quiet because the guys are trying to watch a movie and the other. I was lucky enough to my own room in Charleston because I'm a Oh, this was your room on base? Yes, because I was uh, with, uh, as an enlisted man, I was with another six guys in the barracks room okay. in this new, but I'm a charmer. <laughs> and I talked to either the sergeant or arms or whatever the building said, yeah, well, I'll take care of it. Well, we'll give you a room downstairs and you'll share it with another corpsman. And, and he had different hours, so I had, and it was just a small, you know, two bed thing, but because right. communal things are always down the hall. But it was, you know, it was, I loved it. I loved my Navy days. I loved them. And then, so that was Charleston. They went to Vietnam. It was good. Uh, you had to be careful there. Uh, it was, you know, you had to respect the privacy. If, if people, if I knew somebody was other gay, uh, we would, you know, you know, hook up. But it was, we were, we were just so, we were never alone. And you could never go anywhere because you, know, you don't want to get shot. Right. So, but you said you fell in love with Vietnam. What was that? Yeah, well, that was. I loved him, but he didn't quite love me, and that's always been the, the issue. That's always been the pattern. And it's almost <laughs> like you get you get amorous, you get lustful, and then you fall in love. But it's not love. It's probably just lust. And we had a great relationship, and we talked a lot. And then he got transferred um, to. Uh, everyone gets moved, but I remember. The last moment, because we said goodbye in the barracks, uh, not in the barracks, but in the wards. And then I went back to the barracks and I just kind of laid in my cot, because we all had cots in this Quonset hut looking thing. You know, always had drapes and stuff. And I re remember hearing somebody come in, and all they did is he came in, he came down, gave me a kiss on the lips, and then walked out and left. Mm. And I'm just like, I'm just crying like a baby afterward. <laughs> But it was just those moments. It's going to be the don't. final scene in, the, oh, in your know. Lifetime movie. Exactly. <laughs> I was just thinking, that oh, sounds like beautiful. a scene from a movie. Oh, it's, it's, it was perfect. We'll have to stage perfect. that for the documentary. Yeah, I, I still got pictures of him in my... And they're fun, you know. You know, now he's 70. <laughs> Are you still in contact? No. No, no, no. But after I left Vietnam, I came back to... I wanted to be on a ship. So the last almost 20 months of my t four years... I went to Charles, uh, to uh, 29 Palms, outside Palm Springs in the desert, mm -hmm. in the frickin' bloody desert for 20 months. Never was on a ship. You don't get much more desert years. than that. You know. But gay people everywhere. And that was, I left in 73, so between 71 and 73, those sort of crunched in there was my last tour. I worked in the outpatient uh, clinics on the wards, everyone has duties. I was a personnelman, really, during your day job and then during your assignments, you did the hospital thing. I did well, you know, I was, you know, corpsman of the quarter, you know, we were still secretive, but you could pick up Marines, you could pick up, and, you know, the other Navy guys. Were there gay bars in that no. department? No. no. In Palm Springs at no. that time? No. no. Okay. okay. Well, I don't know, we didn't go to Palm Springs. Oh, okay. I would take the bat what they called the banning bullet was a bus from 29 palms to palm springs and i would take a bus there to san diego and then i would run a car at the, and the greyhound bus depot is still there comes into a hotel called the pickwick hotel on the main strip and i would run a car and then i would go out and cruise and just pick up sailors and was there a lot going on oh god yeah, yeah. oh yeah, yeah. oh yeah <laughs> So, where, did you find a lot of gay men were in the military? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. At that, that time, was never the closeted. Problem. Yeah. Yeah, but <clears throat> you just had to be careful. Did you ever run across someone who was caught or came out and was discharged? Yes, yeah. and that was unfortunate. That was the latter part of my experience at Twenty Nine Palms. I was getting into my last six months, and everything was fine. Everything was fine, and I met somebody, a sergeant that was a marine, that was married, and for me. I was just playing the field. I was not settled down with anybody. He got more serious, but then he he got too serious, and he, he came out to his wife, and then he came out, and then oh, and then I got really uncomfortable, and, and names got named. 
the names got name, and then I was nearing towards the end, and this was, I got out in 73 of March, and um, they had come to me and said, well, do you want to re-enlist? And I said, no, I think I'm ready to go. Well, I, well, I made that decision. So unfortunately, that situation was not a pretty one because anytime somebody has that issue, it's a mental health issue. So they send you to San Diego, you get evaluated for your sickness and your syndrome. And unfortunately, I lost contact with them, but that was, that's, that was not a good part of my my four years that was just unfortunate but when you meet somebody you don't know how they're gonna they're gonna be closet or you know private or then all of a sudden right. not so well tell me how you yeah. felt about you seemed like you were pretty okay mm -hmm. with being gay from the oh beginning. from the beginning I mean, Except, this was the no, 60s. Well, you didn't feel like well, there was, yes. there I was had hardly no, anything in the media yeah, no I had no issues being with it but it was secretive it was very private and that continued to this day it's still very much a part of my life. Even though things have changed, it's not something that I, um, because as we talk later, my, my mother outed me. I didn't, I never told my mother or my, my uh, family anything. We so have been together years. Out. No, no. Ever? Well, maybe to a couple of people to work, but not even that. Yeah. It was not until Maybe the 80s, maybe, yeah. You know, I never I never brought that up at work. Okay. I didn't think that was any well, of our business. a lot of it had to do with where you were working. Too. Yeah, I mean, well, I went to jail for nine years, and that was just not, you were not gonna do that. So that was, when I got in the Navy, I joined- You've been in male environment after male environment after male and, environment. And then, after I went, then I went to the jail for nine years. As a nurse. As a nurse, because I got my nursing license, so, that was in 73, so from set for six years before I met Alan, six years, the first couple of years I never went to gay bars. I went to straight bars and picked up guys. Really? Yes. And well, you did, are a and I, and, I did, <laughs> and, I, and I did quite well. Because um, it was that whole three beard syndrome, and it right. is so true. Yeah. And you charm and you go back and... And, um, James still uses that phrase to this day, three beers. Yeah, yeah three beers, and, and, yeah, and, it, and, and it works. But you're cautious, you're aware. Um, I'm saying that not everyone, not every encounter, I never got in fights or was attacked or anything. Uh, but, you know, you just had to be careful. So you never had any incident of uh, homophobia or, or guys in a car driving by? No. no or you know, I look back at that and not, I don't, nothing. not for me. No. You know, I've been, you know, there was a gay bar he, on Blackstone. Has he been discriminated against because he's Mexican? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a million times. But, but you never came out to your mom? No. No. Not, well, in, not until she knew we were friends. Okay. Never brought it up to people at work. Never brought it up to my family. I remember, I think towards time where I was spending more time with Alan, I came out to my cousin at a dance place. There was disco dance at the uh, old Hacienda. Well, she went home crying. She did, everybody was just a mess. They were like, "Oh man, he's gay." I was like, "Ooh," they did not handle that well. My family, to this day, my family has not handled it well. That's why I'm except sure his mom. His mom. Handled mom it very was fine. Mom and her last husband Leo was great. Unfortunately, he so, passed away. But tell them about the so M Manny's mom was going in for a surgery. Oh yeah, she, but she's drama queen. She has the biggest tiara in the world. <laughs> no one can match her. So. She's going in for a simple little something, something, but she's going to die. And she pulls me and says, well, just in case I die, I just want to let you know that I, I love you and approve of you being together. And I know you're gay. And, blah, blah, blah. and she's going on. And I'm like, what is this? Really? No, you weren't in the room. Oh, it, it was, was you and you. me. Yeah. It was oh, her and okay. me. And, and I just said, yeah, 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 you got it right. And Manny had never told her directly. No. To no. Yeah, your and son is homosexual. <laughs> <laughs> this was how long had you guys been seeing each other that the Oh, we were, we'd been together probably 10 years ago. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. It was just, I was we, just, we were just his roommate. roommate. We were just roommates oh, to, the, to the family. The and my grandparents, to, you know, my grandparents loved him, but it was just his roommate. Yeah. Ellen was roommate. But yeah, so, um, so yeah, so we left. Where are we? I 
forget what you we were. You were at 29 Palms. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So then, well, we've and just then you were back and you were working at the jail. And then I just jail. came back and started working at the jail for all the years. And then that began my career of working. But those years, before I met Alan, six years later, I mostly went to straight bars. It was not until I left. There was a time when I left the jail and I said, this is enough. I can't take the jail anymore. So I transferred jobs to Old Valley Medical Center on Kings Canyon. And I worked in the emergency room. And what happened was, is, is that, Jay. yeah, and I knew, I did not know any gay people, none. Mm. All my gay experiences, so to speak, were in bars, you know, the old refectory or the old bars on, now there were nice refectory, bars on wow. Belmont in those days, not the bars nowadays, or that strip, but uh, there was a bar called the Chateau, Fresno, the old Chateau on Belmont <coughs> that Ron Pearson had. And when I... I, w I went there my first couple of years. And what happened is Ron Pearson and there was a bartender named Doug that I just madly fell in love with, more lust than anything else. But he just had a great personality. And he worked at the Chateau, the old country western bar. Well, Ron Pearson bought the circle and turned it into the Chateau there, which would eventually be the circle years later. So I went, then I could just transfer all my stuff over to the Chateau and did my stuff at the bar there and, um, and just had a wonderful Where time. was the Chateau on Belmont? But that was the circle, the one on... Well, no, where, the where was it no, on the, Belmont? The Belmont one. Oh, the that was... It's a, it's a Mexican restaurant. I, as a matter of fact, uh -huh. I went by there. It's down from where the... Did you ever know where the palace was uh -huh, at? Uh -huh. Yeah. I think it's just a little bit, a little bit closer to town. Yeah. Okay. Um, it was the place. It was it was the Creedence Clearwater Revival it days. It was yeah, it was, it the was place a to go. gay bar for a while. It was sort of like a Mexican yeah. gay bar for yeah. a very maybe a year. But in the right mid seventies, that, that was the place to go. It was the the best. He was he had the best band, uh, dance music, and then it shifted all over. And it was strictly a gay bar, not a straight bar. No, no, it was no, it was a straight bar. bar. It was a country oh, western straight bar. It was a I straight bar. Country. Okay, I love country and western bars. But it wasn't so much, it was that Creedence Clearwater kind of move, um, music in those days. Okay. So, so for those three years, I just sort of followed the straight crowd. But when I switched jobs, then I met some guys at, uh, yeah, I was working in the emergency room and, and we're all the same age. And it's just that three second eye contact. If somebody's still looking at you three seconds later, Hmm. And then you say, well, what do you, you have a girlfriend? No. And then you just, you know, there's that, that, that gay dar that sometimes work. It seems to work better when you're in your 20s <laughs> than, when you're, <laughs> than when you're in your 70s. You don't even know your radar's even on anymore. Right, right, right. So I met Jay and Mark and a couple of the guys and just kind of talked. And these, these were some cuties. We're all just young and just, you know, love the work there. But I had gone to my first gay bar was called the Showbiz. I snuck like him. I said, "Okay, it's time. I know what I want. I know I, there was a gay community center on Belmont before you got to Fresno Street on the left hand side, and I would try and buy it, try to see if there's any gay people there." So finally, I somehow I found out that was the Showbiz. It's not there anymore, but it was a bar catty corner to the bookstore. Um, Susie's? It's kind of by that Dugo Vic. Right, right. Somewhere in there, there was a. It was on that side of the street. It was a beautiful little bar. And you were how old when you decided to step foot into your first game? 20. No, let me see. 25? Yeah. Yeah, 24. Yeah. So I did. And, and that was one of those things where you walked in, but you had this, had to walk around. The wall was here, so you had to kind of walk in and walk around. And the first song I heard when I walked in there was Dancing Queen. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> it just came out. So I'm like, oh, and I looked around, like, ooh, a couple of guys in the dark. And had a beer. I don't even think I finished half the beer and I left. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, oh. That was my, yeah. I don't so, think I finished half the And I'm going, why? Right, you've, been, you've been carrying on for years and this is bothering you? So that's that whole thing, how you're raised, the whole religious part of it, you know, the whole thing that it's like, uh. 
So when you say you were comfortable with it, you did have some trepidation. Now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was like weird. Why am I doing this when you've been fooling around ever since you've been 11? Right. You have an issue now coming into a gay bar where the other guys around you are the same, you know? So, but what happened is I went back to the... I went in there that night. Oh, yeah. Okay, then I went back. I wanted to do an evening. I want to see what it was that later on on a weekend evening. And I drove up, pulled up, going to the front door, and there's Jay, Mark, and all the guys from the hospital. And that moment changed my life forever. That was the opening. I said, okay, these are my, these are my peeps. I'm here, and the rest is history. It was like uh, just coming out, going in, dancing, this and that. Jay and I end up being roommates, end up being boyfriends for a little while, but we were more roommates because our personalities did. But we stayed together as roommates in, in uh, Sunnyside for two years. and had. That's where we sort of just went out. People, we, you know, I have to correct myself, we did come out as gay because they knew we were gay in the mid-70s. Um, at the hospital. At the hospital because there was a whole bunch of gay people at the hospital. And then Jay and I had parties in those days, those Saturday Night Live kind of nights, where we had marijuana, booze, food. And the party started at 11 o'clock at night, and y'all came over. Because they'd just gotten off their shifts they all, at the hospital. And when they came over to our apartment, which was a two-bedroom kind of a condo thing with a side den, the party was started at 11, wouldn't stop until 6, to the dismay of our neighbors that we got evicted twice. <laughs> But one of my gay doctors that lived in the next apartment always talked for us. But we had policemen, firemen, nurses, everybody, all walks coming into this gay establishment, feeling easy to do whatever they wanted. I would check the guns from the police officers in my bedroom in the drawer. They would go in and schmooze the nurses and stuff. They had the food. You had the food people, the booze people, and the people who did the dope, marijuana and stuff in the other room. And it was just angelic. It was wonderful. So there's no issues about being gay, straight, or whatever. Because I had the chief, Dr. Webster, the chief of the emergency room there. I had doctors there. I had, you know, the chief of OBGYN. So it worked. You didn't have any fear of reprisal. Or no, because the so. 70s were a glorious decade. Yeah, yeah. For free, willing, do whatever. It was that way. And so... That's what it was from the time the mid seventies until I met him in seventy nine. That's the way it was. It was just and he uh, was a. Um, I mean, I think even a step further was he became a bartender. The circle at the. Did you ever bartend out at the no, one? No, no. Okay, it was just. Was it always <coughs> called a circle when it was Bill Chin disco? I, when point. Bill Chin took over with Jack Chase, the first yeah. owners. Okay. I think it was the circle. circle. Yeah. Because so, I had some old flyers at, at the Pride this year, and there was ads, and it was called the Circle Disco. Yeah. Yeah, I think. And there yeah. was a friend, I made friends, uh, Al Rose um, was the bartender there, and so during time, over time, I just became, then I became more familiar with the court group. Those people that were interested in the court, Darlene, uh, David, his roommate was an empress mm -hmm. at one time, and um, so... But what happened is I was still going to the bars. Uh, I was never, I was always afraid to go to the Red Lantern. It was like, oh, it's a leather bar, Western. They're gonna, you know. But, um, but, have you have you had people talk to you about the? And then there was a the hangout. And there was a bar called the hangout, the hangout. Okay. Out on Herndon. So this is the thing I think is always Herndon interesting. Herndon in '99. Manny says. When I started going there, when I first started hitting all these gay bars, <clears> it was the. Hangout, Showbiz, Red Lantern. Uh, the Palace? Was the palace? I, I don't think the Palace was. Orange, Orange Ogre? Was that around? I don't remember that. I but I lived Jesse in Sunnyside. I lived in Clovis. And I can leave Herndon in 99, where go all the way down Herndon, Clovis or sunny, to Sunnyside, and get there without any hardly any stop signs or. It was just country roads. In those roads. days, yeah, In was. those days, yeah, there was nothing. He could get off at 11 from the hospital and, like, be... Well, I can go... I can, yeah, I can go there before the... Yeah. Yeah, and be out at this bar that was out way out here. You know, like it was a fun It was a fun Like, in bar. 20 minutes. I met a lot of my friends I still have now. There. I remember Herndon being just nothing. Yeah. You just yeah. all, went all the way yeah. So, I just bartended just being a typical work. 
didn't do too much with my family. Stayed, you know. Uh, so you bartended at which bar? The Circle. The Circle. The one on. And this was, Bush. you said it was the Chateau and they moved it over to the Circle and made that the second Chateau. Was it straight? Yeah, at that time. Y- yes. It was yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. But so then you were bartending one. at a straight bar? No, that no, was. No, no, no. No, that was when Doug had it and Ron Pierce has still had it before he sold it it was literally a, a straight bar okay then he wanted to get out man he was just a then, customer trying to pick up the bar the <laughs> but I did finally get Doug uh. so if you remember the pool room in the back oh yeah I've done my time on that pool too. <laughs> so you know all good things do happen yeah but he but that's the thing about when do you're you dealing know, with straight men or bisexual men which I I've had a lot of you know uh, dealings with is that um, because we continue that encounter even after when I lived had my apartment, Doug would come over. He'd be pissed off at his girlfriend. Mm-hmm. Manny will make you feel better. <laughs> so there's all that the mechanism. transition of the chateau to the circle. I mean, did it close and then reopen? Yes, yes. and okay. then Bill Chin and the rest of them took okay. it over and changed the changed a little bit uh, to that disco. <coughs> effect with a lighted floor right um because ron pierce's did not have the lighted floor oh okay it all became and that was a great place that early circle was just the best so but during the time i made friends with alan and a few others and then became kind of a quasi part-time bartender because i had a regular job so i'd either i'd look at my watch at the emergency room going oh it's almost 11 okay then i jam over to the bar extremes and that's how i met him Supposedly, I don't remember. I was just in those days. It was quantity, not quality. So it was like next, <laughs> next. You know, you know, and they were was, they those weren't, bars they were, weren't ordering craft cocktails no. then. In those like, days, no. there there were yeah. hundreds. There were hundreds in those in the bar. It was yeah. just unbelievable. So that's how. Um, and I would have continued just to be single and having you know boyfriends for two weeks and then boyfriends <laughs> for two weeks and stuff and still working uh mom didn't know didn't i didn't associate with my family very much my grandparents yes that they, they were you know might still see them but what about uh, touchstones for you like alan mentioned in the interview magazine and the after dark and the playgirl and it was the tip you, it was the typical you know you, you pick up the newspaper now remember the seminary from 14 on nothing you know it was just looking at the other my other brother in his cassock and white and in his collar because we never we had dormitories but your private areas where you showered and that was all sequestered i mean you had your private little thing you never saw each other in, in your underwear okay so it was like okay so but i so it was like when you're a kid it's like oh looking at sports magazines and watching and looking at the pictures of guys in in those days the shorts were much shorter for basketball players they're almost like daisy dukes in those days so it was nice and i uh, remember a picture i had of joe namath without a shirt on mm-hmm. him that i just about wore out <laughs> yeah so it was and my little you know my grandfather it was you know that that was going to come in the house it was a uh, tv i was madly in love with the young guy from rifleman i think we we're about the same age um, Rin Tin Tin's blonde haired kid so there was things on TV that kind of attra- you att- get attracted to um, but if you have that attraction even at 10 or 11 years old there's a kid in the next desk or that the test that you had to roll, flip up like this right, with right. a little inkwell right. you know that's how old uh, you just say you just you just admire him from afar or lust from afar oh, God, yeah. but um, so that was so I knew that <coughs> but uh when you get older, then you just then you just go for it. You know, can I buy you a drink, sir? <laughs> well, good segue here. So mm-hmm. let's talk about when you mm-hmm. guys met. So both so of you it, was, uh, here. Uh, it was it uh, was seventy nine. Um, I had what seventy nine. Was I already in the court system or no? Yeah, you were emperor. Yeah. Oh, so, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's a whole different because of the group that I had been in. Or, or got to know, they said, oh, why don't you run for emperor? This was 1978. I won in 78. Um, he was emperor number four. Four. And, and they're four at like 50. Still in single digits. <laughs> they're they're like six. six. How do I not know this about you? 
Okay. Emperor VI. So, um, in the 1970 is when I really got involved with the people. And of course, you're in the bar. That was one of the leading bars in that time. But it was also the court system that was still going on. Al, who he co-bartended with. Darlene was the fifth empress. Right. So she was... And Billy Smith was a bartender at the circle at that time. Okay. And Billy, so Queen of, Mother Billy had been you know, obviously all, involved. All in of them court, were part so. of the court system in the sense that they were either a prince or princess or something or a duchess or whatever. And I was just being introduced to these people. And I sort of remember going to some functions in those days. But they said, well, you, why don't you decide to run for emperor? Uh, uh. And I so I did. That was 1978. Now, so you just decided on a whim to run for emperor. Well, well, with the it wasn't as big an issue. Chris. It was, it, in those days, it, it was basically like, meant that you got to go traveling places yeah, and go to great right. parties. But it was right. with Les Gatewood, and he was okay. the empress. Okay. Very strong-willed empress, you know, and that was fine. You make all the decisions. You do whatever you want to do. I'm just going to go for all the fun. And um, so, but the. David was coming down with, I can't remember the guy that was the emperor with him. James. James? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. Was this around the Tiffany Taylor Tate time? No, or? this was. Tiffany much was like a, she was like a, a little princess girl at that yeah. point. Okay. She These was, are, she was Dar- David was the material fifth, quite yet. So I came in during that fifth reign of David, I mean of Darlene and James. So when they, when it was time but for was, a new one to be like they do nowadays, wants to run and wants to be the whatever empress Les came up and i really didn't even know Les that much because he wasn't a bar person but evidently he wanted to be so i was so we did the campaigning thing and and um at the exhibit hall at the convention center downtown is we had it now 70 now there's a year in those days for whatever reason i should have left in 79 but i didn't leave until 1980 because they wanted the dates to be coincide with to... something. So I think our reigns were probably one of the longest, if not the longest reign. It went on not like, like 14, 19 months or 14 or wow. 16 months, whatever it was. I can't remember. I'd have to and look at all Did you have to stuff. do what they do now? You're responsible for fundraising and all oh, that? Oh, yeah. Stuff. But in those days, it, it was, was different. In those days, it was just putting your picture up on the wall. It wasn't like all the stuff they do now. Right. It was like, it was more. Like, oh, this picture's nice. And well, talk and, or whatever. And and in those days, you could you could do a show at the circle, and you could raise some money. Right. You know, I just and, don't remember doing that. Yeah, we did. did we, we did all of those things. Yeah, we did the shows for my. Dude. Not not. I don't know when you ran, but I know after. Oh, afterward, but not yeah. so much during that ran because in those days, the people from out of town voted. Okay. So it was who you knew and who you schmoozed. And because Darlene was the past empress and James, she had a lot of clout. And because Al and David and that group had a lot of clout, I was sort of under their um, umbrella. So they were, in a way, giving me, uh, you know, the, the, what do you call it, the imprimatur or whatever they could. Right, right. You know, they were going to sanction me above anybody else. And I don't quite remember who my other... Was anybody running against I you? I don't remember. <laughs> so I sang live for my introduction, you know, for my little thing. And it was, you know, lots, hundreds and hundreds of people in those days. And I won. And then that. So it was in 1970. So by the time of the middle of June in 1979, we met in June, probably six months later. Okay. And how we met is that I was just on a bus tour with a group going to San Francisco for the Pride Parade. And he was with his Fresno State group along um and virgil would do these uh bus trips where you went to the bar got on the bus at two went to two in the morning two in the morning two in the morning <laughs> still kept drinking on the bus <laughs> go open up Polk gulch or some bar in San Francisco at six. Opened at six in the morning then oh my stack <laughs> over to somewhere you're going to watch the parade go to the thing and then hit more bars on your way home so by that afternoon i met alan and the Ramrod? The Ramrod, yeah. Ramrod. They took us so to... you were both on separate bus trips? Too? No. We're no, on the same bus. Was, we're on the same oh, bus. He was way bus. in the back, and I was up in the front because I was with my Fresno State friends, and we didn't want to associate with those degenerates that were in the back <laughs> who had been drinking all night long, and, 
you know, didn't seem very nice and all that kind of stuff. Quite okay. frankly, that was very much our attitude. Okay. So, so, so tell me <clears throat> what happened when you so, met. So, oh, we just met him. We were, I, I was coming out of the bathroom and Tiffany. Because uh, I thought you guys met at the circle. Oh, no. Well, well he saw me. I as saw an him I and I, I fell deeply in lust for him. He looked like Tony Orlando. <laughs> <laughs> And I, that was when Tony Orlando had his own show, and I just thought he was dreamy. And, and I, just, he, I just saw him as another face in the next. Next. <laughs> next. What do you want? Next. You want a beer? What do you want? Yeah. So he didn't, he didn't notice me. And they were doing shows then, and yeah. Manny would sing live. And I just thought that was The regular amazing. court shows, a lot of court shows at that time at the Circle. So we were doing production numbers, and, and I was singing live, and that's, that's where he saw me. So we went and uh, got to San Francisco and all my kind of Fresno State friends were like, oh no, we're not going into the bar. Let's go shopping or something at <laughs> six in the morning. I don't know. They were very, and I, I was kind of like that too. I wasn't very, I wasn't much of a drinker or much of a partier. Um, and then went to the parade and, um, and then we ended up, they wanted to take us to one South of Market bar. And I guess we couldn't get into the Eagle or whatever. So we ended up in this place called the Ramrod. And literally, we were supposed to get back on the bus. And they were driving us back to Fresno that night. So it was like 6 o'clock in the evening that, that night. And Tiffany walks over to me and she says, well... And I, I kind of think a little bit that she was like trying to maybe pick mm. me up or something. But she was like, so did, have you met anybody? Or did what was your first experience? Like, who do you, who do you like? And stuff like that. And I thought, oh, I really like Manny. He's so cute. And, all this kind of stuff. And so she introduced us. Um, As I'm walking out of the bathroom. <laughs> doing things that sometimes you do in bathrooms in leather bars. I don't remember. <laughs> I'm not going to put it on the recording. So anyway, <laughs> anyway. So we, um, outside in, in the so we got, we got um, back onto the bus. And he came up to the front of the bus. And on the whole way home, he sat with me and we did nothing but make out for the whole trip home and um i was in seventh heaven and then we got closer to getting home and he said um well i said do you want to come over to my house when we get to, get to Ab or get to fresno and he goes well i can't because my boyfriend is in the back of the bus <laughs> i wasn't totally an angel <laughs> And so, and then, and and then, then we then. did, we went separate ways and I didn't know what was going to happen. And about three weeks, I don't know I how think, this would have worked, I think but the court, we were doing the court. I was, because I was the emperor, things were happening. Things were coming up and he got, he knew somebody. Was it over in the mobile home park where we had to do? Yeah, some, Scott. Scott. Yeah. So somehow we got reconnected through going over to Scott's house to do. I thing. hate to I say know. this, but I thought it was to do like a float for something yeah. or something like that, which mean, which doesn't make any sense unless it was that, because we did San Francisco, but LA, I don't know. What year are we in now? 79. 79, 79. okay. So, but anyway, so there was this opportunity to go work on a project. Maybe we were putting together a set for a show or something like that. And, so then we start seeing each other. And Scott invited me over and there was Manny and we reconnected. And you did not have a boyfriend at this time? No, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. Wasn't what was his? I was. I was. When, not, didn't he get sick and you had to take him to the yeah, hospital yeah, that night yeah. or something like that? Or I was not a very nice person. I was not a very nice person. I, I got a reputation as being a two week wonder. Don't don't get in. It's, people would tell their friends, don't get involved with Manny. Two weeks later, I'll dump you. So not nice, meaning promiscuous. Is that what you're saying? Oh, I, yeah, I was promiscuous. Well, was, he was a serial monogamist. Yeah, I'll be I'll be with you for two weeks, but oh, I don't, I don't expect yeah. it to be longer. Yeah. So what was different this time? I don't know, because I did not have any intention of settling down. But he's persistent. He's really persistent. You know, and um, and maybe it was just in, in in because I do believe in fate. I do believe in there is a, a road, a destiny, whatever. It's all sort of mapped out. You just sort of hopefully fall into place. Because with my promiscuity, I probably wouldn't be alive today. So he probably saved my life and maybe all that had... Because 79, so oh, it was the next it was year. Dark. Yeah, it was happening. Um, what and a lot of people you guys? Were, well, a lot of people in our court system died. Died. Right. Yeah. You know, by the early 80s, we would have people that were going 
to gay, uh, were part of gay bowling leagues and part of the court system and doing this and that, and all of a sudden a year later they're, they're gone. So, so when, when you remember the first death of a friend, what year that was? Either one of you? Well, I started volunteering for the Central Valley AIDS team, and then I actually got hired, and I was working for was the Central the Valley AIDS team. So that was 80, I'm trying to figure out. Okay, so wait a second, I would have, okay, so 77, 78, 79, 80, that would have been like 81 or 82. Sounds right. So, um, I mean, I was, and they hired me to do education, to go out in the community and do education, but then we also um, were finding that we needed to do more client service kind of work. So, um, or no, maybe it was vice versa. I think they hired me because my degree was in social work. So they hired me for that, and but then I ended up doing a lot of education out in the community because we were just getting all these requests and stuff like that. So I would be like at community hospital doing a group of nurses doing education during the day and then we would take on hospital visits at night so there was a guy named Michael Bridge who worked there and Kay Vanderford and uh, Mona Jenkins and myself and we would kind of see how many folks do we have in the hospital and then we would you know you take those two I'll take these three and those kinds of things so we kind of, our days got split between that. And what drew you to go uh, volunteer at Central Valley AIDS team? Was it friends that were, you were losing friends, or was it just the general uh, I don't think AIDS at that crisis? point I, that I had lost anybody, but I just felt like this is my community. This mm -hmm. is... And basically, that whole thing, we had to take care of ourselves because we weren't yeah. being right. acknowledged yeah. or whatever. So, and within the core system because it was an organization that really had a lot of tra you went out and had a lot of fun and when you traveled and you went to these different cities you had these events in those days you were still doing the sexual activity that you did in the 70s but in the 80s you were paying the price but for I, it, I, I have to say that in the <clears throat> in the 80 early 80s the court system was one of the first oh, yes, groups that yes. started saying we need to raise money right and I think that was a contributing factor and mm -hmm. I remember I remember mm -hmm. like empresses in Reno and stuff that died really yeah, early in the yeah. epidemic and um, and those kinds of things and so there was that kind of like firsthand experience of knowing mm -hmm. somebody who had died and um, <clears throat> and so I went to a vol I decided I'm gonna go volunteer with the Central Valley AIDS team so I went and I participated like in a whole weekend of training and stuff like that and they trained us how to be peers or how to answer phones and stuff like that um, and then literally six months later, I had just, I was just getting ready to do my one year probation as a social worker at Madera County and they fired me <laughs> and it was like, what am I going to do now? And, um, and literally a week later I was working at the Central Valley AIDS team. Mm -hmm. So, and that sort of drove, you know, my career up to today. So. Because it gave you the incentive to get your master's. Yeah, because then I went back and got then, my master's. and You know, what the world turns around and he's back working in the same... So now I'm working for Madera County, County, but working for public health instead of... So now he's services. making lots of money. But I worked for 16 for years for the health yeah. department in Fresno mm -hmm. doing yeah. HIV work. And that took me to Community Regional Medical Center and Planned Parenthood and Madera County. And but we did lose a lot of friends in the 80s. Yeah. Well, and I lost, I lost a lot of friends who started out as clients right because yeah, I lost Darlene we lost Darlene yeah we lost Darlene the yeah. Darlene who we lost Al's roommate uh, David who was the fifth empress I can't remember the year he passed away but it was in I can't remember now but it was just we're losing everybody was just early it was the early yeah. 80s because we were actually at the house when she died because I was yeah, yeah I was at there. the bedside when she died when he died so, so it was very much a part of our lives. You were, and that's why towards, um, well, it would be 40 years ago, that's why I, I was very involved with the court system for about 10 years after I was in, and then I just stopped. So for a good 30 plus years, I haven't done anything. It got to the point where, for the court system, for us, I think, it got to the point where it was, it wasn't fun anymore. Yeah. It just wasn't fun anymore. And maybe it was that we'd gotten older and 
what we, we used to with our have fun, and, you know, yeah. wasn't fun anymore. But there was also just something different. Something different, yeah. Something I hear changed. that from a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's and just... I mean, we, I mean, during the time, I, and I'm, I, I shouldn't say this because it's probably not true, but during the time that, for that 10 years, that was the, those were the years we had floats in the parade in San Francisco, Los Angeles. Was very, we were those very were the active. years that Jerry and Doug became Mr. and Mrs. National Gay Rodeo. And I mean, we were yeah, doing a, shit. Yeah. And it we was went, great. Yeah. And Flag Corps, and we went and marched in the parades all over for Flag Corps. And, um, you know, we opened the community center and all those different kinds of things. But I think it, if you go from the 80s to towards the night and then you start losing the people right. that made all that happen. Right. And then it changed. And I think people's attitudes changed and I just sort of, you know, we weren't bar hopping anymore. We didn't want to go and you know, drink all this night. Is, this is what stuff. we used to do. Al, when Al was starting to do the early shift at the circle and we would go and have coffee with Al at the bar, and then when the disco music came on, it was like, okay, it's time for us to go home. <laughs> but we loved, you know, the we loved the quiet and sitting and talking with him and our friends Dan and Elaine would come and, mm-hmm. you know, and um, that whole thing. So it, it was just a shift. And but... it, 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 it changes when you couple up. Right. And then if you're single, then of course, it, as long as you can stay in that mode of meeting people, especially in bar situations or whatever, or even whatever, but when you couple and you and then you've been for ten, then another twenty years, and then you've got thirty years, it's just like okay, this is routine. You know, we don't go to the if I go to the gay bars, it's like oh, the music too loud. Oh, like, uh. You know, do I really do you do I really have to dance? Do you guys, do you guys go out now at all? No, no. 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 I mean, I, I have uh, some young friends that want to. Hey, you want to go out to the bar? I'm going. Okay, since I feel like I'm the chaperone in here. But I have good friends that Manny always go. Manny always says says that he wishes that somebody could open up oh. a nice little piano bar oh, just for gay people. Yeah. <laughs> that, but you know, you know, for younger. Oh, I mean, there's. I don't want to compete. I'm not there to compete, and I'm not there to. And that the music now, I don't appreciate. So, you know, so it's like, um, so it's like I have and nowadays in Fresno, you can go and have a very gay experience in a lot of bars and restaurants. In this exactly. town, exactly. It, it's that are not it, gay. That are not gay, right? You know, um, Which and I've had a relationship with a bartender over at Piazza del Pony for years, Nathan, before he left to go work in Las Vegas. He knew I was gay, but he was just sweetheart. And a lot of them are; they know we're a gay couple, right? Because we've been going out every Friday night for thirty years, and so we know all the staff, we know all the people in the bars and stuff. They know. And they know that, uh, and that's part of what's doing the yeah. gay bars in is because you can go anywhere now. It's not yeah. like it used to be. We could only go to gay bars, right? Um, okay. Um, so, how did the AIDS crisis affect your relationship? Did it affect your relationship? So you were obviously fairly yeah, promiscuous well, before. Then we weren't anymore. Um, you guys get tested on a regular basis? Was that fear no. inside of you? No. No. no, no, we just never strayed, which was... Really he doesn't weird. believe this, <laughs> but, but Manny was the first person I ever had sex with. Okay. So I can't say... Who doesn't believe this? Manny doesn't believe this? Yes, Manny doesn't believe this. You must have been pretty good then. <laughs> yeah, so, but... I don't know if we did or not. I don't remember. I don't, but we never, never strayed. I think, so. I think there may have been, I think at one point we, we did have serious conversations because he had worked in the medical field and because I was know, exposed to a lot of stuff. I mean, I had, and the, working uh, in the emergency room, you know, before pre AIDS, a whole, you know, a needle stick kind of thing was not something necessarily that you worried about eight, uh, hepatitis B working in the hospital. I was always sticking myself with blood. And so I think, I, I think when we thought about testing and it, and I know, I know I've tested, but mm-hmm. I can't, but I think it had more to do with like, 
you know, like, because I was drawing blood, too, at the health department. But, I mean, we had all, you know, we, you know, we were using universal was precautions still, and all that kind of stuff. So I was still doing all that stuff. Whether it was required, I don't know if it was a requirement when I was working in the hospital. But, no, it was just... Um, so, no, we, whether, we, I don't know, think we ever felt like we were we have to get at risk yeah. or anything like that just because we, you know, we're with, just mm -hmm. with each other. Okay. So what so, about navigating life, gay life in Fresno now? What, how does it feel? How is it to you now? Hmm. I know we, when, we, when Alan talked and I talk about this all the time, that coming out is an everyday process no matter how long you've been mm -hmm. out. So, uh, it's well, wonderful. now it's comfortable. Okay. I, now I don't have an issue. Because when we got married eight years ago, I did not want to. The get guy married. who sold us the dryer at Best Buy last month knows he's got a husband. <laughs> I mean, he. I'm so surprised because for so long he was so kind of like, you know, he's he's just lo you know he's just low key and stuff like that. He just does not hesitate to say, not "Well, my husband and I are." Da, 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 da. I and I was at Trader Joe's on Sunday, and the clerk said. Well, what do you got planned for the rest of your week? What are, have you got planned for the rest of your Sunday? And I said, well, my husband and I have got plans. Mm -hmm. We're going to go meet some friends for brunch and stuff like that. And it just kind of comes out anymore. Yeah, and, and it's part of it is because I want to put that in people's faces with the, the era that we live in, that I'm not going to you know, be quieted. Right. And if I don't like this table that you're seating me at, that I think, right. now that's my, and that happened it. just last week. Well, I'm going to okay. speak up. You know, we were at Max's. We were at Max's. Okay. And I wanted a nice, quiet Friday night dinner. And, and all of a sudden, we're pleasant. And we made reservations. And she herds us all around the corner, all the way around the back to the very last table in the corner by the entrance. <laughs> and I just said, I'm thinking, I was, no. And I'm, as, we're, as she's taking us there, I said, and I'm sitting there thinking, I'm going to say, are you putting us here because we're gay? <laughs> and it was like, I want to, it's like what Manny's saying. It's like, I want to put this in people's faces. But the thing is, though, I... We don't know that because I immediately said, no, I think we'll just eat at the bar. Um, no, I'm not, I don't want the stable. Oh, okay. So I was, you know, I, I try to be firm and pleasant without being rude to the, because I know, and sometimes they want to fill a spot because of the waiter situation, da, 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 da. But I noticed Somebody things, there was two guys tables, sitting so right there at the back. table right here. I'm going, wait a minute, you know. And for, I don't like the arrangement in that restaurant because there's the, it's the boo, it's the row, and I don't like sharing my conversation with it. So as we're walking to the bar, I see this two top right there, number table number four. Remember that table number four. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, oh, that one is that one free? Just can you clean it up? Oh yeah, we'll take care of that. We'll clean it up. So I went to the bar, got a drink. I said, I had a wonderful evening. But I remember the first time 40 years ago in Santa Cruz that two guys. He and me walked into a, a ocean something restaurant in Santa Cruz. They walked us through the whole restaurant, sat us at a table between two swinging doors, <laughs> going in and out of the, the kitchens. And I'm going, and I remember that we sat there. And you think and that was took a gay-related thing? I well, don't know. I don't yeah. know. Well, I don't know. Um, I, I think but those kinds of thoughts cross all our minds. I, I know. I, but I is remember this about being gay. Is it not? If I bring it up, am I or being you're a gonna, bad person? You know, do you want to put the Hispanic guy back by the kitchen just in case they need <laughs> a little help? <laughs> some dishes you something. know. So, but yeah. So that still to this time, <coughs> I, I still put it out there. So now, you know, I'm not gonna. I'm careful. I mean, I'm not gonna embarrass myself or make the other person uncomfortable. So. Um, but he knows I'm, I'm, I'll work a, a Are you the first person to say my husband, or are you the first person to say my husband? He you are. Is. I think we're pretty well, even, We're there Steven. now. Yeah. We're there now. Because I know you, I mean, even with us, you know, you go to a grocery store, and the, the clerk will say mm -hmm. something like, what do you, what do you have mm -hmm. planned? And James is always like, mm -hmm. well, my husband and I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm less now, likely yeah. to do so. Now, last I, night, I last night, I didn't tell you this, last night, Sue got there before I did. Mm -hmm. I had Roger Rockets last night with my friend Sue. We've been doing it like 25 years. She says, um, the, the hostess says, I said, I know we switched tables because we're, we had to switch our dates, so I don't think we're at a regular table. And she goes, oh, no, your wife got here early, and she's right over there. And I just like, I'm not going to correct you. So, but I thought that was Yeah, funny. it's the same situation that here. I have many uh, Southeast Asian haircutters, and they're always like, well, how's your wife doing? I just, 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 
She's doing fine. <laughs> I mean, there's times when you just like to go and just like you just have don't, to let it go. Just yeah. let it go. I'm it's not, not that important. I'm not, it's not yeah. important. You're not, I don't know you. Just cut my hair. I'm only right. here for 12 minutes. Right. I'm out of here. Right. I have to but say, I want to. 99 percent of the time, we have no issues. It's it's and it's always because it's a younger person. I think that's what I feel most. Yeah. If it's a younger person, you know, I I am more inclined to think. You know that it this is, isn't going to throw you. Um, but sometimes I wonder when, when I get in conversations with people, I because I walk the dogs on the weekend, and sometimes I end up in conversations with people like, oh, oh your dogs are so cute, or oh, your dog is cute too, and all that kind of stuff. And then you, you know, you start, and it all depends on how I can read them. But mm-hmm. I'm less inclined to do it if I'm if they're younger people, but if they're a little bit older, sometimes I'm a little more cautious. I just wanted to say how much I'm proud, how proud I am of the way the community has kind of emerged and grown. When I talk to people out of town and I tell them, yeah, we have one of the longest running film festivals in the country. Um, Oh my God, you should see our pride parade. It's, you know, amazing. And it's, there's a, you know, a great event that happens. Um, It was sad when the community center went away, but you know, at least we had one for a while and stuff like that. And so I think it's, I, I think those kinds of institutions are so important, not only for the community themselves, but for the for the straight community to be able to see that there's culture here, there's vibrancy, and that um, and that you know you're welcome too. It's so funny. We go to the twenty years ago at the Pride Parade. It was the Ku Klux Klan. Mm-hmm. Now when I go to the Pride Parade, I see more of my straight friends than anybody else. Yeah, exactly. So it's kind of crazy the way the dynamics yeah, have changed. And you asked, okay, what do you do? Do you go to the gay bars or do you do whatever? What do you do? Well, we go out among yourself. But we have more association. I would say probably 90% of our time that we spend are with our straight friends. Right. Um, he has particular groups. We have, now that I'm retired, there's groups. I have my Fresno County retirement group from the 80s. And I have my uh, group. They do breakfast. Like we do breakfast tomorrow. and things. But we've, um, my ex-church lady group, we're in our 60s, 70s, and 80s. We hang together and party, rent houses at the coast. We spend time together. There's the our couples group. There's four couples. Yeah. Three couples are straight, us. Uh, he's got a group. He's got his stuff that he does. So uh, over the years, it's by your example. It's the example that we set did not impress my my family, evidently. Uh, my mother passed away over a year ago. Haven't heard from him since. Mm-hmm. So, so no other gay people in your family that you know of. I have a gay second cousin and um, two gay cousins. It was my grandmother's mm-hmm. brother's children. We haven't heard from them in a long. Yeah, time. so we don't know if they're so. So I, I think it's by our example, by just being nice, pleasant people, and not. You know, buttheads that you and you share now. I'm going to a funeral. One of my friends from that I've known since the '80s. Tomorrow, his dad passed away. So we've gone through marriages and funerals. The whole gamut of what a couple would do, or a single person would do in the last 40 years, because we're uh, time together. We shared everybody's triumphs and failures, and now we're at our age. We're sharing each other's, our friends' maladies in a way. I got this, I and got reti- that. You know, people are retiring now mm-hmm. and stuff like that. The thing that I think is kind of interesting is that probably 20 years ago, we thought that the only couples we wanted to spend time with were other gay couples. Mm-hmm. And now it's less about them being gay and more about us having something in common. Like these, the couples that we hang out with, the all of them have some kind of Planned Parenthood affiliation. So... The, all of the women all were employees of Planned Parenthood when I was there. And so we kind of know that we have a lot of the same values and we um, think a lot of about the same things are, that are important to us and those kinds of things. And that's what kind of brings us together. It's not so much about the fact that, oh, you're gay or you're straight or anything like that. So, um, And it's, it's interesting be- because, I mean, there are... I don't know, there's... <clears throat> We've got some friends, Gina, so we hang out with Gina, and Gina's obviously got these friends. 
and um, sometimes I feel like we're just so out of the loop because <laughs> they're talking about their you know trip to Greece and and the you know the kitchen they remodeled and I, I just don't feel like we can keep up with them sometimes and there's Jim's Jim Jim Sandiford Jim Sandiford uh, He's Glenn and Bri- do you know Glenn and Brian mm-hmm, totally. yeah that whole group I just I you know and they've just kind of got this little click and and we're just not a part of it and we don't you know I think from from my perspective we're, and not, we're, not we're, I'm not saying anything no, bad about them. I'm, I'm just saying but, it's an example of where here's here's a group of gay people that probably 20 years ago we would have fallen right in with, mm-hmm. and it we surprisingly don't. I think I, it's we age, just don't feel have. I think it's age, with. and I think it's just a comfort level that we we have home, and we have home, and I right. feel very comfortable. You know, and we have routines. Right. Um, he works and stuff, so. Um, and he's got a few more years to work. I'm not. I retired, so I had to switch and, and do other things. But it's a comfort level where we're not so much bar hoppers anymore. And, and being in bed at eight thirty or nine o'clock is not unreasonable, you know. So it's like, oh, okay. You, you. You know, they want to be at the bar at eleven, and then go to another one. That means I got to take a nap <laughs> and do whatever. You know, now that I'm out of the yeah. bar, the bar life, mm-hmm. and because uh, mm-hmm. I remember I used to try to get everybody to come to the bar, come to the bar, yeah, and support the bar. Oh, yeah. But now that I'm, you know, up at five thirty in the morning and going to an eight to five job, and I'm in bed mm-hmm. by nine, <coughs> ten o'clock, um, I, I remember when I used to say to people, "Come on, come on out to the bar, come see the show." When mm-hmm. does the show start? Midnight. Midnight. <laughs> yeah. And I feel the same way now. Yeah. And back yeah. then I was like, "What do you mean you're not coming out?" And I'm like, "I wouldn't." Either, yeah, completely yeah. understand. Yeah, I have a, a friend that's in his twenties and then wants to go to the bars, and I'm like, "Just tell me about it." <laughs> <laughs> Snapchat me or something. But don't Give me a synopsis. Yeah. So yeah, so um, straight friends are important in our lives because it makes up a great part of my, the friends I've known since the '80s. Um, we have friends. He has a fa- uh, he has a a group of friends that go back many years that just because of his type of work and and the networking he's done over the years so he's um, he's out and about but for me I'm got the backyard my garden the dogs so I'm more not that I'm an introvert but I, I like the quiet yeah I don't get that introvert thing from you at all <laughs> I'm not, I'm not. Well, hey, I think that's a good place to stop. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, do you guys have anything else you want to add? No. no. Okay. So, um, let me see if I can.